everyone for coming. Um, let me give just a quick rundown of what Platypus is, and then we can talk about the panel. Uh, the Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December 20, uh, 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s through 30s, new 1960s through 70s, and post-political 1980s through 90s left for the possibility of emancipatory politics today. So the panel today is uh, the crisis in Ukraine and the left. Let me read the, the prompt here. Following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, some on the left have tried to underestimate, or tr sorry, have tried to understand the present crisis with reference to imperialism and national self-determination and the role of Marxist revolutionaries like Lenin in the First World War. How should the left understand the current crisis in Ukraine? What is the meaning of these terms, imperialism, anti-imperialism, and national self-determination for the left today? How do we reflect upon the slogan of turning the imperialist war into a civil war, considering the absence of an international left today? Let me give the, some information about our panelists, starting with CJ Micah. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Mike. Mike. CJ Mike is a member of the Center for Political Innovations Chicago section, the, insp the aspirationally named Chicago, Chicago Workers School, an education an educational project begun in October 2021. It aims to become a web of Marxist-Leninist reading groups composed of people from all over the city. It seeks not only to be engaged in training members in theory, but also connecting this theory to the proletariat <coughs> by winning the more advanced sections of the class over to it through agitational and propagandistic work to be, to be the leaders of the masses when the next crisis brings them into motion. The Chicago Workers' School has an in-person reading group in Southside, as well as a Zoom-based reading group covering members scattered throughout the city and its strategizing methods of growth. It's not a party, nor does it exclude members of other organizations. Jerry Boyle is a Chicago lawyer, probably best known as a volunteer legal observer for the National Lawyers Guild. In that capacity, he has served most left organizations that have a street presence. In order to avoid conflicts of interest, he generally abstains from formal association with political groups, though he is a lifelong Irish Republican. And finally, in the middle, we have Joel Finkel. Joel has been a member of Solidarity since 1990. He has been active in labor, Central American, and Palestinian solidarity movements. In 2000, Joel was a founding member of Not In My Name, now the Chicago chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace, in which he was active for two decades. Solidarity is a revolutionary, socialist, feminist, anti-racist organization that was founded as a project of regroupment of the American anti-capitalist and anti-Stalinist left. Committed to international socialism and revolutionary change from the bottom up, Solidarity members strive to be the best non-sectarian activists and advocates for democracy within all our work. Uh, so going in the order in which I read the bios. Uh, let's begin with opening uh, remarks. This will be 10 to 12 minutes, and uh, we can begin with uh, CJ Mike. Okay. All right. Comrades, friends, uh, thank you to the Platypus Society for the invitation to speak tonight on behalf of the Chicago Workers' School, Center for Political Innovation Chicago. I will stress before beginning that we are not a party, and therefore uh, I have not come to give a party line, but my own understanding. I want to start off by saying uh, what I have not come here to do. I have not come to argue about words, the words we should be using to describe the events in Ukraine and Donbass, with one notable exception. I have not come to argue over petty details and forget the larger perspective. And I have not come to uh, discuss the history any more than necessary. There are plenty of uh, alternative media platforms that have covered these events in a more comprehensive way than this panel allows me the time to do. Finally, I have not come here to discuss arguments uh, hinged around questions of sovereignty, morality, etc. Our task tonight is to discuss the line the left should be taking on this conflict and how it relates to imperialism as defined by Lenin. I would add that our chief question should be how do recent events fit into our path to victory, to revolution? This will be my focus. Are these events an impediment or are they progressive? How we understand this conflict will prepare us for understanding the conflicts already visible on the horizon. 
When we, when we seek to understand imperialism, we must look to Lenin. To his two essential texts on the topic, Imperialism the Highest Stage of Capitalism and Imperialism in the Split in Socialism. In the former, he seeks to understand imperialism. In the latter, he shows the effects, its effects on our movement. How does Lenin understand imperialism? Lenin says, the begin Lenin says this in the beginning of chapter seven of Imperialism, the Highest Age of Capitalism, that imperialism is the epoch of finance capital. Finance capital is a result of industrial monopolies merging with bank capital. He enumerates five essential features of this stage of capitalism. One, the concentration of production of capital develops to such a high degree that it creates monopolies which play a decisive role in economic life. Two, the merging of bank capital with industrial capital and the creation on the basis of this finance capital of a financial oligarchy. The export of capital, which has become extremely important as distinguished from the export of commodities. The formation of international uh, capitalist monopolies which share the world among themselves. The territorial division of the world among the greatest capitalist powers is completed. We are still living in this time of amicable divisions of the world markets between the greatest capitalist powers. Our period is characterized by US dominance of an imperial bloc, and through this, the entire world. Some have called this US hege hege hegemony. Um, we are, however, beginning to see the cracks of this dominance form slowly. We must first ask ourselves, is Russia imperialist? Um, Russia is a capitalist state, and capitalism, if allowed the chance, will develop into imperialism. However, Russia today has an economy roughly the size of Italy's. Its capital exports are pathetic, and most of its foreign trade is in raw materials, notably natural gas. The only category in which Russia ranks among the great powers is military might, which is not an essential element of imperialism. We can leave the question here. It has lost its significance to us. Either Russia is a capitalist state in the simple form, or it is a pathetic imp of an imperialist state in all but arms. There is one camp in the conflict. The opposing camp is led by our own imperialist bourgeoisie, who are our chief enemies and deserve our undying hatred for what they have done in our name, not only to the peoples of the world, but also the people at home. It is our task as socialists, as revolutionaries, to liquidate this full work of global reaction. How is this overthrow to be done? Marx tells us that theory becomes a material force when in the hands of the masses. Our task is to realize this, to win over the future leaders of the working class toward an independent working class politics guided by a truly revolutionary theory. Once this has been done sufficiently, the next great economic crisis or war, which inevitably will occur, will be the advent of liberation. The masses will be in motion, and as revolutionaries with deep roots in the masses, we and those we went over will guide those masses to victory, to the dictatorship of the proletariat, socialism, and communism. This is what we can do. But note that we can cannot choose the crisis, nor do we support crisis. Crisis means suffering and death. Crisis is a result of the system, not any one person or organization's wishes. However, this crisis is necessary to bring the masses into motion. Capitalism and capitalism imperialism in our day creates crisis. How does it do so? Capitalism is exploitative, leading to the impoverishment of the proletariat and the broader masses, reducing the scale of the market to, the, to which capitalists can sell, a crisis of, of overproduction. Today, however, the picture is more complicated. Imperialism in our day exploits the neo-colonies to bring back to the core super profits, which it can afford to distribute to some workers as bribes for class peace. This is the system that produces those temporary privileges for this layer of workers bought off by imperialism. From this bribed layer of the proletariat come those who claim to speak in the name of all workers while truly speaking only for themselves. These are the opportunists and social imperialists that Lenin calls out in Imperialism and the Split in Socialism. Yet, the neo yet as the neocolonial possessions of our imperialists break away from their domination and lean towards other great powers, our imperialists will see their super this, that the super profits necessary for this expensive class piece are harder and harder to come by. Workers will be less satisfied with their ever decreasing bribes Lenin calls these bribes temporary for a reason. They are dependent on super profits. I will repeat that we have no say in the workings of capitalism and have no desire to actively work to maintain the domination of the world by our bourgeoisie that is a prerequisite for a class peace at home. This would be blatant social imperialism. 
We support the fall of the US empire just as we support the rising of the sun, both being inevitable, making any notion of support a mere empty gesture. In Ukraine, we see this process of US, US imperial decline. It is unable to secure its markets, less so to expand them. The crisis of overproduction grows more acute. Russia's victory would greatly restrict US access to Ukraine, not to mention Russia. Less access to imp inputs and less access to export markets means the expansion of the crisis at home. Perhaps more impactful is the world's gradual shift away from the dollar and the role of the present conflict in accelerating this trend. Since US domination is tied so closely to the world's use of the dollar in international transactions. And the longer and longer list of sanctioned countries are becoming a block that can trade <coughs> among themselves. As alternatives arise, US will no longer be the global middleman in trade, making sanctions less and less impactful. Further, Russia's show of force in Ukraine emboldens ascendant China and all those countries that have been on the periphery of the US empire. The US share of the global economy is going to shrink as countries move to the China camp. The US will be less and less able to prevent this. This will exasperate the crises in the US and lead to ever greater impoverishment of the working class with our bourgeoisie desperately trying to keep the same size slice of an ever shrinking pie. Again, this is an observation. Marxists do not support the impoverishment of the masses, but rather observe that this is a product of the capitalist imperialist system. Nor is the revolution the product of ideological appeal alone, but instead primarily the product of circumstance of the crisis plus the conscious element, us. Only after the crisis has reached a boiling point, when the masses of people led by the proletariat see that their imperialist bourgeoisie are leading their country off a cliff, will they rally to our camp, the camp of progress, development, and stability. We need to be ready for this. We must sink our roots deep into the masses. If we reach the masses and establish Marxism-Leninism, a truly anti-imperialist message that clarifies the workings of the system here and abroad, among the most advanced, the most class conscious, and they, with roots in their workplaces and communities, can establish themselves as leaders, come the next crisis, we will win. Russia is not the enemy of socialists in the US imperial core. Russia is, however, the enemy of the imperialist bourgeoisie and the social imperialists among us that seek to continue this expensive class peace and those temporary privileges of which Lenin spoke on the backs of the masses of the neocolonies. The working class Russians and Chinese have great legacies behind them. The Russians have their Lenin and Stalin eras. The Chinese have their Mao era. Depending on your way of seeing things, uh, you could add or subtract from these lists. But we trust that they will sort things out in their respective countries. Our enemy is at home. Our enemy's existence distorts the class struggle in Russia and China, feeding class collaboration against US imperialism. Only after the great menace of US imperialism is weakened by its opponents will we, or the American branch of the international proletarian movement, be, um, see greater prospects for victory. Once we win, and once our comrades in the lesser imperialist countries win, those in Russia and China will be able to throw off the yoke of class collaboration, of capitalist relations, and march beside us toward our shared destiny. I will recommend uh, these slogans and end my remarks with by, by offering a quote by the often overlooked essay of Lenin's, the 1915 defeat of one's own government in the imperialist war. To the masses, we should say our enemy is at home. To the more conscious elements, we should say not pacifism, but anti-imperialism. Lenin says, the, on the only policy, not verbal, sorry, the only policy of actual, not verbal, disruption of the class truce, of acceptance of the class struggle, is for the proletariat to take advantage of the difficulties experienced by its government and its bourgeoisie in order to overthrow them. This, however, cannot be achieved or striven for without desiring the defeat of one's own government and without contributing to this defeat. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for having me. Uh, he mentioned I'm a legal observer. I'm not here to speak for the bill. You <laughs> might recognize these hats you see as a protest on the stage. Um, but I'm not speaking for the guild tonight. I don't think the guild has an official position on this. Um, I am speaking as an Irish Republican. And uh, when I ended up putting a title on this, I called it Unwinding the Legacy of Imperialism because I believe that we're wit what we're witnessing now in Ukraine is just the latest example of the protracted unraveling of imperialism. 
it catches more attention than examples on other continents, specifically because it's happening in Europe, ground zero for the sort of imperialism Lenin analyzed. Um, but we have recently seen another European example in Catalonia. And uh, we also have the longstanding examples of Basque and Irish insurgencies, which have resisted that species of imperialism for centuries since it was born in England and the Netherlands. Uh, Eurasian hordes have been sweep sweeping across the European peninsula from time immemorial. Irish were just the, in the first wave, so we really can't claim to be fundamentally different, though our perspective and role are different because we always resisted it. <clears throat> and we shouldn't be surprised if it's coming home to Europe. The, the fundamental order established by, in Europe by the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 was always tenuous. Those expressing surprise and shock now have apparently forgotten that Europeans started two world wars in the 20th century. So this was inevitable, and it's only beginning. Um, human sociology has changed, evolved, and you can choose whether to describe that change as post-millennial or post-modern. Either way, the mechanisms of change have themselves changed in characteristic ways. Disintermediation, atomization, acceleration, and polarization. Um, these mechanisms are driven by max access to the means of production and distribution of information. There will be military aspects to the coming conflicts, but as it was with the Irish struggle, those are distractions, albeit spectacular. The principal resource and principal weapon is information. Our previous consensus reality is breaking down as a result. The conflicts will be won and lost primarily on the plane of abstraction, of ideas and words. Winning the narrative is the main effect. And I caution that although Ukraine is currently winning the narrative, and losing the armed conflict, we're dealing with protracted conflicts that are unlikely to be resolved definitively in our lifetimes. Uh, atomization is another way of referring to what many call democratization, uh, but I prefer to call it populism. That's, that's a known thing in politics. It's a natural result of disintermediation. When the narrative is no longer mediated by a hierarchy, the masses compose the narrative in the plural. Populism is bivalent, polarized, and triangulating. Right, population, uh, right populism triangulates down. Left populism triangulates up. Acceleration, a vector of direction and velocity, is the crucial factor. We already know direction pretty well as class and identity politics. But I think we don't su su sufficiently appreciate velocity. The futurists early in the last century had a good handle on the aesthetic, but unfortunately, most of them went right. More recently, Paul Virilio seemed to get the basic concept, albeit with an obtuse and somewhat suspect analysis. We need to be faster than the right. And I'd stress this isn't just about what happens out the U outside the U.S. I'd even say what happens in the U.S. largely determines events elsewhere. We may be a collapsing empire, but we're still an empire. Rome wasn't destroyed in a day. Um, by the time Alaric arrived at the gates of the imperial capital, the city was already his. The masses were with him. It was just a question of working out the details with the Pope a fellow Christian, uh, but the process which made that possible required many years of effort by individuals and groups making choices. The strategic indications are good for us in terms of ultimate success, although tactically, again, we're looking at a protracted process. We are improving and moving faster. I think of when the Tea Party, Party movement began. I shuddered because we, we've been through a crash and you're going to see populism. 
And if the first thing to spring up is right populism, it's, oh my God. Um, it goes in the wrong direction. It took a while for Occupy Wall Street to respond. In contrast, with the 2020 uprising, we moved faster. And the right populist response, the Capitol riot, was too little, too late. The situation in the UK, and specifically in occupied Ireland, has some predictive value for us. We are, after all, a former British colony. So our elites tend to mimic the ideation of our former colonial overlords. The UK lost most of its colonies after World War II. And its first and last colony, Ireland, has some lessons for us. After centuries of armed conflict, the Irish now get to sit back and watch the last remnants of the empire self-destruct at its rotten core. And note that I'm focusing less on states than on the masses who fill their borders. The real changes will come from below, not from above, though states and multinational organizations can and will play a role. Again, I'd use the example of Ireland. Irish have been at war with England for centuries. And Irish Republicans have been at war with the Irish Free State since it was founded. The EU, the Catholic Church, and the US government, the UK's puppet master, were ferociously opposed to us for various reasons. That did not prevent us from using them when it suited our purposes. The genius of the Good Friday Agreement is that we got all the state and multinational parties to agree to it. That diffuses the power of individual state actors and empowers us. When the UK tries to breach the Good Friday Agreement with Brexit, for instance, the other parties prevent it. When I say the Westphalian order is collapsing, I mean specifically two things. One, if that's order, we're better off with disorder. And two, we're better off with our traditional nation states as well. Again, occupied Ireland is a good example. There is no sovereign state there. Sovereignty is by definition exclusive. But sovereignty in occupied Ireland is legally shared by the UK and the Irish Free State. The EU impairs sovereignty as well. It's why the Brits did Brexit. But occupied Ireland remains in the EU. An international organization attached to a state, the Vatican, has facilities in every neighborhood. And a global superpower, the US, guarantees this diffusion of sovereignty. We undermine states from below. I feel obliged to make an aside here, uh, just so nobody gets the wrong impression. Sure, Joe Biden crows about his Irish heritage and insists on adherence to the Good Friday Agreement, but we will never trust the United States government and will never forget that Biden was a sellout who carried water for the Brits before we went to work for him. We're using him. He is not our ally, and he's not trustworthy. You can never, ever trust the US government. It doesn't have allies, it has interests. The Kurds, long-standing allies of the Irish, get that. And it's why they were very careful not to piss off Assad. They knew they'd need Assad when the US abandoned them. Never trust the US. The point here is that atomization isn't just an issue with social groups, it's also an issue with states which will likely spend the foreseeable future getting carved up in co into constituent parts that never belong together anyway. There is a future for multilateral international organizations, but no future for nation states, at least not as we know them now. Irish are fine with this. Before the Norman invasion 800 years ago, we operated really well without a state or police or prisons. States are not necessary, but the transition from centripetal to centrifugal forces will take time, and things could get pretty ugly in the interim. 
Now, when I read this next thing, I, I guess I should explain something for folks who don't know the history. Um, in 1969, we, in Derry, we had the Battle of the Bogside, where native forces fought off British security forces and declared a no-go no zone. And there's a famous mural wall there. You are now entering Free Derry. It's still there. It's frequently updated to reflect current events. You know, during the BLM protests, they, they put hands up, don't shoot, or I can't breathe. Uh, they frequently express solidarity with groups all over the world. In my darker moments during the 2020 uprising, I imagine the intersections where the murals would appear. You are now entering free Chicago. The good news is we get most of the city, including the green zone, the city's central core, marked off by official paramilitaries during the uprising. The bad news is we're looking at decades, at least, of conflict. So we have to move fast, and the movement has to come from the bottom up and aim up. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for inviting Solidarity, and it's a uh, great, great turnout. Um, I'm going to take um, a different uh, tack than uh, the other two uh, previous speakers. Um, and excuse me if I'm not as erudite um, and as theoretical, I'd like to talk about Ukraine um, because to understand if we're going to have a discussion of empire and imperialism as pertains to Ukraine, I think it's proper to uh, start with, with Ukraine. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, and uh, I'll try to keep my remarks brief because I think most important will be a discussion. Um, and I will begin. Um, by uh, condemning uh, what Russia has done. Uh, Full-throated and unapologetically, um, I condemn uh, Russians, Russia's invasion of a sovereign country. I think it's important to start there. What they are doing is illegal, and what they are doing is immoral. What they are doing, however, is not unique. Of course, the United States has done much the same over and over and over again. Baghdad, Fallujah, I mean, we can go on and on. Israel is doing exactly the same thing. Israel destroyed Beirut. Israel is occupying and has annexed part of Syria. This is... Um, the hypocrisy of the American media in uh, not pointing this out is, uh, is quite stunning. And of course, um, Putin, the Russians have done the same thing in Chechnya, in Aleppo. So what they are doing um, in Ukraine is, is not unique to them. Um, but it is more than a tragedy, it's an outrage. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on in Ukraine, and I want to start by talking about what it is not. The conflict is not some Cold War mythological battle between the forces of democracy and the forces of authoritarianism, as the US mass media would have everybody believe. This is just nonsense. <coughs> It is also not due to any sort of threat to Russia that Ukraine has posed. After all, last year there was no threat. The year before there was no threat. Why all of a sudden is there a threat from NATO? Right? 
Now, this is not to say that there aren't serious reasons to be opposed to NATO. But let's be clear, that is not what has motivated Putin and the criminal oligarchy that runs that country. So what is it about? Well, first of all, it's about mistakes made by all sides. Okay? The failure to negotiate for years and years that could have resolved the issues. Um, it's also, more than anything, about the collapse of Russian society. The Russian economy is in shambles, due in large part to neoliberal economic policies which have privatized the commonwealth and led to the development of a criminal capitalist oligarchy. The people are furious, and this can be seen by the fact that the day the war began, there were demonstrations against it in Russia. Now, this is very unusual. Normally, it takes months. It takes people coming home and, you know, soldiers coming home in body bags before you see street protests in Russia. No, it was the day that the attacks began. Why? Because people are pissed off. They're pissed off at the government. They're pissed off at Putin. Putin needed a way to create a sort of patriotic nationalist fervor, nationalist pride. And he thought that what was the, it was going to be easy to do because we're going to attack the Nazis in Ukraine. And it's going to be like that. And we're going to be victorious. And that is going to sweep all our problems under the rug. Well, it didn't happen. First of all, well, yes, there are Nazis in Ukraine. There are not that many. Of course, there are Nazis in Russia. Right? You know, one side says, you know, glory to Ukraine. The other says, you know, glory to, glory to Mother Russia. And here, they say, America first, right? There are Nazis all over, right? Not nearly as many Nazis as there used to be in Ukraine. The idea that a Jew could get 70% of the vote you know, from people whose parents, many of whom supported Hitler. I mean, this is, you know, quite a significant, this is quite a significant change in Ukraine. Yes, there are Nazis there. It's a problem, but it's overblown. The Nazi, the, the, the neo-Nazi party and the elections in which um, Zelensky got 70% of the vote, they got less than 1% of the vote. So I suggest that the main reason that Putin um, has attacked uh, Ukraine is, uh, you know, a shiny toy. Oh, look over there, right? Um, because the Russian people are seriously pissed off. And they've been coming out in the thousands. Um, and it's quite dangerous for them to do so. They're being arrested in the thousands. Um, as I say, there, there have been mistakes made by, made by all sides. And the fact that the United States reneged on its, uh, pro, on its uh, promise to Gorbachev that NATO would not expand, of course, that, you know, that's, that's, that's obviously um, part, of the, part of the problem. But it is not the driving force. Right. Oh, and by the way, let me step back. You know, Putin initially said that, that what they were going to do was decommunitize Ukraine, as if there were, you know, because he blames Lenin, uh, you know, for the creation of, of, of Ukraine. Um, uh, well, I'll turn to that later. Um, we have a nice little quote from Lenin here from 1917. 
Um, so I would say that that is the main that is the main impetus. That's the main reason that that we're, that Ukraine you know Ukraine finds itself in this situation. Um, what is liable to happen? Uh, well, I think what's going to happen is um, Putin is going to understand that there is absolutely no way he can win this war. He can't. He, he's even the oligarchs, all of whom, by the way, left the country, along with the oligarchs in Ukraine. I mean, they left the country too. Um, uh, the oligarchs aren't going to stand. Uh, they are not going to go down with Putin's ship. Uh, and so there may be some um, some action on the part of the on part of the oligarchs or on a part of the military. Personally, I hope not. I hope that the whole regime is overthrown by the people from the bottom up. Uh, we'll see if that happens. But I think what's more likely to happen is that um, Russia and Ukraine uh, will negotiate, um, pretty much negotiate the breakup of Ukraine. Um, Crimea, okay, that's, that's Russia's, you know, the other breakaway republics, you know, breakaway regions, okay, you can have those two, just stop bombing our, you know, stop bombing our, bombing our people. The question then is, what do we do, right? What, do, what does the international left do about this? Well, one, we, we fundamentally support the right of Ukraine to defend itself, to get arms from anywhere it can to defend itself. Now, this is not, I am not advocating that the United States um, you know, uh, blow up the world. Um, but I do, I do um, fully uh, support Ukraine's ability uh, to get weapons to defend itself from anywhere. So that's the first thing. We have to support the Ukrainian resistance. We have to understand that the United States empire is nobody's friend. The Russian empire is nobody's friend. We need to build an international movement from the bottom up that says, screw both of these empires. We don't want any of them. We don't want NATO. We don't want US imperialism. We don't want Russian imperialism. And we can talk all night about how we define imperialism. Okay, we get the basic idea. It's empire building, whether it's for um, uh, securing resources or securing um, markets. Uh, the, the Russian empire is just as vicious as, as the empire of the United States. So we have, to, we have to build a movement from below, international movement of workers who will reject both empires. And I'm going to leave it there, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion. Thanks. All right, so now we're going to do um, brief uh, responses from the, the panelists, and we can go in the order that we started in. Um, but just, you know, three, four minutes uh, kind of reflection on uh, what you've heard so far. You can go ahead, CJ Mike. Um, to the last speaker, um, I, I, I purposely avoided these kinds of discussions in my speech, but uh, uh, talking about Russia as if it's like a tottering regime, I think is far from reality. Um, I, you must be getting our information from different sources, but uh, from my understanding, uh, there's this, I have to go back a little bit, but the CIA essentially gave up some of its responsibilities and passed them on to the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, and you, throughout much of Asia, throughout much of Europe, um, you see these so-called color revolutions. Um, you saw it in Ukraine twice. Um, um, there are 
attempts going on in Southeast Asia, but uh, and there are also attempts going on in Russia, and they're moving east towards China. Um, and in Russia, it's like the Navalnyite current, um, uh, Alexei Navalny, um, the I guess something like a Russian Juan Guaido. Um, but uh, you have these mass networks with so much funding. And so, of course, they're going to be out the next day. They might be out the next hour because that's, that's how connected these uh, uh, US meddling operations are. Um, and so if, if you look at the photos from those protests and you look at the flags, um, I don't know, use Google Images or Google Translate to break down the Cyrillic Russian. Um, you'll, you'll, you can trace these organizations back to the National Endowment for Democracy, the U.S. Um, essentially taking over for the CIA. Um, so that's not an accurate, from everything I know, um, that's not an accurate um, depiction of the situation in Russia. And it's, then you can look at the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. And if they were in power, they would have done this earlier. Um, it's pretty much what uh, Zhiganov says. Um, so, I, I just want that's all I'll say about that. And then, you know, the number one, I totally agree with you that uh, no matter what anybody did, um, waging an aggressive war is the worst war crime of all, and not just. I mean, basic principles of international law. I mean, this is just something that everybody kind of agrees on, so it's kind of bottom line stuff. <coughs> and, um, you know, waging a, a, an aggressive war isn't just wrong, it's stupid. It usually blows up in your face. <coughs> and it's what we hung people for at Nuremberg. Um, so I, I totally agree with you on that. I, on the other hand, I, I agree with you, <laughs> all right? The notion that this was unprovoked, no. Uh, NATO has been provoking Russia consistently since the Soviet Union fell apart. And in recent memory, I mean, Putin has made it crystal clear no further. It started out with in Georgia when some US stooge um, got elected in a color revolution and they had disputed territories in the Caucasus and in Ingushetia and South Ossetia. And he decided, I'll rally the world behind me and we will take back South Ossetia. And he got creamed <coughs> by Putin and driven out of the country. Oddly enough, he ended up in Ukraine, Saakashvili. And so Putin made it clear, don't come any closer. Um, Chechnya was a little different in the sense that, I mean, Russia always maintained control of that, so they considered that internal Russia. And yeah, I mean, what, what they did in Chechnya was just terrible. On the other hand, Chechnya got little or no support from the United States government. Um, you know, they generally classified them as terrorists. Um, and I say, my brother was one of their ambassadors until they killed all his clients. Um, and um, more instructive is what happened in 2014 in Ukraine. And um, it's like, okay, you wanna play that game with um, Ukraine. Um, the strategic asset in that region is the Crimea. It's always been a strategic asset and particularly for Russia. It's not the first time we've had a war over Crimea. And Putin just took it. And that was a clear message to NATO, don't push your luck. Uh, and then we've been provoking them ever since. And you know, I, I don't know if folks remember, but it's a whole series of provocations. And last summer, uh, the the Brits, a United States proxy, did a freedom of navigation cruise in the Black Sea and inked a deal with the Ukrainian government to build naval bases in Odessa 
and in a town on the Azov Sea. All right. So nothing justifies waging an aggressive war, but on the other hand, deliberate provocation by the United States has been going on for decades. And um, Russia, I think, rightfully sees itself getting encircled and cornered. And the United States goads these people on. But, you know, an analogy I used today with a friend was, you know, that Biden walks <coughs> by Ukraine's house and says, you've got a bear in your backyard. And, and Ukraine's like, well, yeah, but I don't want to fuck with it. And he says, oh, no, you got to fuck with it, and hits it with the pole. And then the bear bashes down the back door and starts killing people inside. And, and Ukraine's like, well, you started this fight, help me. It's, no, 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 we don't want to start a nuclear war. Um, so again, I, I agree with you that nothing justifies this invasion. But I also agree with you that there was tremendous provocation from the United States and from NATO. And they're both toxic forces in, in this conflict. Um, so a lot of dirty hands here. And uh, an awful lot of dirty Hands. And it's sad because the election of Zelensky, it's, there is that, that division within Ukraine. Those who favor Russia, those who favor Ukraine. And Zelensky's election seemed to be everybody in Ukraine saying, let's set that aside and build our own future. And it's, it's terrible what's happened as a result. Yeah. You know. Okay, well, I, I do not want to downplay um, the, um, the issues um, arising from uh, U.S. imperialism and the United States' um, insistent, insistence on being um, the global capitalist um, uh, master, um, and of course NATO is is part of that uh, project. I do not, however, think that the timing of uh, Putin's invasion um, has much to do with that. I think it has more to do with internal uh, internal issues within Russia, which is going through social a deep social and political and economic crisis. Now, to suggest that the demonstrations in Russia by ordinary Russian society is somehow a product of the CIA um, is, I think, stretching it. And I will say, let me point out that the information that, that, that in, what informs my thinking on this is Boris Kagarlitsky, who is a Russian Marxist. And I think it is worthwhile paying attention to Boris Kagarlitsky. Um, he's been at this a very long time. He's been a, um, a scholar of, uh, of, Russian politics and, and Marxist politics. Um, he points out the extent to which Russia is completely dependent on the West. For instance, many of the, many of the parts of the, for their weaponry use uh, chips that are made in Taiwan. Right? They're not going to, they, they can't win this war because they can't even replenish their supplies. They're totally dependent on, on the West. So it was a, a grotesque miscalculation on Putin's part that he thought that it would just be a simple thing. And he did not expect there to be um, masses of people in the streets in St. Petersburg right? and in Moscow. Right? And I just, I, I reject the idea 
that um, the Russians, <coughs> the, the Russian masses are motivated by some sort of, you know, um, U.S. you know propaganda and U.S. organizing. I just don't. I just don't believe it. I think they are pissed off at their own fucked up economy, and they're rising up now. What will it lead to? Um, well, hopefully, hopefully it'll it'll lead to something progressive within, within Russia. There's no guarantee, um, but it could lead to um, a rejection of the, of the oligarchy, this criminal capitalist class that, um, that is uh, brilliant at extracting value from the masses. Right? putting it in their own pocket and, you know, buying soccer teams and whatnot, right? So I, I, I just reject the idea that, the, um, that the, the Russian people are not motivated by their own uh, concerns rather than the concerns of the United States and, and Western capital. All right, let's um, move on to our question and can, answer. Can I make one more comment, please, that I forgot? Yeah. Um, I don't think that um, it's, I don't think that Ukraine was going to be offered membership in NATO. The Germans wouldn't have allowed it. It, 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 it just wasn't on the, it, it, it wasn't on the, on the agenda, right? So I don't think that it, as, as expand, as, as terrible as NATO is, right, that is not the immediate threat to Russia or to Putin. The immediate threat was his own people. All right, so let's go to questions. We'll start with uh, Chris. Go ahead. Um, okay, so I think that it, this was raised maybe by um, two of the speakers. Uh, about the kind of military aggression as an expression of weakness on the part of the Russian government and Putin in particular, like the Putin regime. Um, what about the weakness or the opportunity presented by the US government and US politics? What about those kinds of calculations? Um, you know, on the issue of whether there's popular resistance to Putin and whether it's facilitated by um, American-funded international organizations, I mean, that could go in any direction, right? In other words, like, you could have people supported by um, the, uh, uh, what's the euphemism for the CIA? Uh, it's not a euphemism. It's, a, it's technically an NGO, but right. it's funded by the Congress every year. Um, it's called National Endowment for Democracy. National Endowment for, the, for Democracy. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be controlled by the United States, right? Like anything can happen. Um, in the same way that, you know, even if Ukraine was never going to be a member of NATO, it was still supported by uh, Western Europe and the United States, the government there. There was still a lot of collaboration, but that doesn't negate the fact that Ukraine can have its own policy or what have you. Um, so, in thinking about this in terms of American, you know, or U.S. hegemony politically and the global order, how does that factor into it? In other words, rather than thinking about, um, you know, the weakness of Putin and whether he overreached, overplayed, and is going to undermine himself, what about the um, the effects here? What do you guys want of this situation as a positive outcome in terms of American politics. Uh, let me just say very briefly, I think, I think what Putin has done is something that uh, the United States has been unable to do. I mean, uh, Bush, Obama, you know, they've united Europe, right. you know, they've, they've made NATO even stronger. Right, Putin has has done something that that the American ruling class uh, is 
just thrilled with. Mm -hmm. I'm more sanguine. I mean, the United States and NATO, they got their asses kicked in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a paper tiger. I mean, and unless they're going to engage in nuclear war, mm -hmm. all right, because there's real power there, uh, they don't know how to win a war. Um, and I mean, the recent examples of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, you know, Bush went in there to sit on Iran, mm -hmm. all right, and all he, all, all he ended up doing was proving to Iran that our military is useless. We got beat by a bunch of peasants with light arms. And um, so um, I'm kind of sanguine on that. I'm sure uh, people will rally and say, oh, NATO is alive again. Well, it, it's alive until the next time it tries to do something serious and gets its ass kicked again. Um, NATO was set up um, to fight a nuclear war with Russia. Mm -hmm. Everything else it's ever done, it's fucked and lost. Its record is terrible. And it really, it should have vanished after the Soviet Union mm -hmm. fell apart. It's lost its purpose. So I, I'm kind of sanguine about that. I mean, in terms of unifying Europe and uni unifying NATO, well, that, that'll last for a while, but that won't last for long. Uh, are you saying then that, that uh, NATO really doesn't um, represent a threat to Russia? Oh, sure it represents a threat to Russia, and, and again, specifically because it was made to conduct a nuclear war, all right? But it never had any illusions about winning a land war in Europe. The U United States troops that were there were a tripwire. Cross this line, we send nukes. And, and that's what we're putting in Latvia and Lithuania now, is tripwires. You're going to have to that's kill easy. U.S. troops in order to invade NATO countries. Um, the NATO knew it would never beat Russia in Europe. It was going to be a nuclear war. That was the threat. And um, so, again, short of nuclear war, NATO's a paper tiger. So is the United States. We, we burn a lot of money on a military. It didn't do us any good. It was kind of pathetic what happened in Afghanistan. It was also inevitable. Well, that's military. What about politics? I think politics is its practice. By, uh, mainstream politics is its practice in the United States is doomed. Um, it's... Um, I think Republican voters kind of, kind of got that when they elected Trump. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of people who identify as Democrats who are in denial about that. It's it's why Biden got elected. It's no, let's pretend things haven't changed. And you know his disastrous presidency is is the result. I think my whole uh, introductory remarks were uh, about that. Okay. Mm. We can move on to another question. Um, let's do this one and then we'll come to you. Um, so to sort of bring the discussion to um, what people in the U.S. can do. I know that at least two of the speakers have talked to you sort of like support for the right of Ukraine to defend itself. Um, the sort of typical liberal strain that you see is just like living vicariously through the state, just like have the U.S. send arms and that's like good. Um, and I guess my question is, um, on, is there a, a, a meaningful uh, sort of stance that individuals can take? Is it acceptable to sort of like endorse the U.S. doing something? Is that the same as, as endorsing U.S. interests? Is there a line that can be drawn? What sort of position should we take if we accept that like we should be supporting Ukraine's right to self-defense? Uh, 
I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I think that it's, it's not so much what individuals do, it's what individuals do with, together, right? It, what we need is a, is a movement um, that, um, that supports self-determination for people and that opposes any obstacle to that, whether it be Russian imperialism or US Western imperialism. So I think that what's important for, for the left is for us to build, build movements, working class movements, democratic movements in the United States and around the world. And so it's not so much what each individual can do. Um, uh, I'd say there's a lot you can do. Um, again, it's um, it's push the narrative, push the narrative. Well, you know, there are other things you can do, but I'd say anybody thinking about <coughs> supporting a foreign military operation, uh, better lawyer up. <laughs> Um, it's why lawyers became prominent for so long in the Irish struggle. We've stepped back now. All right, but yeah, I mean, if, if that's what you're looking for, work very closely with lawyers. And, uh, and I point out the fact that the United States government is allowing people to go there and fight. Well, yeah, they, they supported people doing that in Bosnia too. And then five years later, they're all terrorists and catching felonies. So that's a very dangerous game. I'm not saying don't play it. The Irish played it for 40 years. Um, but don't, uh, don't underestimate what you can do with messaging. Um, and I, I think of a smaller example, but it matters. Um, you know, just to put it in context, it's uh, when I was riding my bike home after a long day on May 30, 2020 in Chicago, it's like I saw what I saw, and I thought it was brilliant. But on the other hand, I thought, holy shit, when white people find out how much property was destroyed, they are going to freak, okay? And we are going to look like shit, all right? When I finally got up in the, you know, the next day, you know, I go right online, and I look what messaging is there. And I was really pleasantly surprised at all the people who worked out night, uh, walked all night getting out good messaging. Because we actually came off well. Usually in Anglo culture, you destroy property, they have a fetish about property. You know, somebody looted. Oh my God. And, um, well, I mean, Irish know that. It's, you know, it's in the final negotiations, it was three. Um, low casualty, high cost bombings that made the deal. Every time they walked away from the, every time they walked away from the table, boom, up goes the Baltic Exchange. That'll cost you a trillion. Next time, boom, Bishopsgate, their Wall Street. There's another trillion for you. And finally, boom, Canary Wharf. They understand money. They care about it too much. And, um, and you usually get that reaction in the United States. Why didn't we get that reaction? It's because of people like you. Um, you know, the, the elites don't really control the narrative anymore. So don't underestimate your ability to shape the narrative. Um, and don't underestimate the importance of shaping that narrative. I would add to that that uh, that's, that's definitely one side, but the other side is getting this kind of abstract international situation and tying it back into how it affects working people in the US. So I'll admit I haven't gone out and done it yet, but I have a sign written up, I use a whiteboard, and I'm gonna stand in front of a gas station. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, right now it's 88 cents, I'm gonna double check before I go back out there. but. Literally 88 cents from like a month ago. Um, 
mostly, um, mostly due to what's been going on in Ukraine. So, like, let's say this is what uh, Biden's imperialism costs you at the pump, and then it, little calculations if anyone wants to look. And it's like Dakota Camry costs this much, but like trying to connect the international situation or the more abstract things that don't necessarily directly affect someone uh, in, into their showing how that affects their daily life, um, I think is another aspect of that. It's important. Uh, I would like to add to that that um, the United States gets about 1% of its oil from Russia. The inflated prices at the gas pump, in my opinion, have nothing to do with the situation in Ukraine. It has to do with oil companies seeing how easy it is to take advantage of an international conflict to increase their profits. Just that simple. Inflation isn't due to anything other than the capitalists raising prices. So the idea that, you know, um, you know, if I were going to go out with a sign, an anti-war sign, for instance, it would say, pardon me for being a little, uh, well, it would say no war but class war. But I think I think we shouldn't. Uh, the the U.S. economy, um, for many people, is doing very well, and we have to recognize that. For many people, it's doing very poorly, um, and it's it's not it's not all because of U.S. foreign policy. I, I just want to backtrack for one second and, and point out that. The expansion of NATO beyond what it was, what was promised uh, to Gorbachev, uh, was to a large extent due to the military-industrial complex, who made huge profits off of expanding NATO and and expanding, you know, and just building arms, right? Huge profits, and there's a an economic um, uh, theory called the permanent arms economy, uh, which suggests that it's the military-industrial complex where profits are artificially high, right, and the products are not pumped back into production, right? It's like you make money digging a hole and then you make money filling it up, right, and. It, nothing goes back into, you're not building machines to build, you know, to increase productivity, right? So this is the theory of the permanent arms economy that may explain, you know, part of, part of U.S. foreign policy. I recommend people might want to look up, you know, that economic theory. It's a Marxist economic theory that was developed in the 70s. I strongly object the provocation thesis because it reverses the order of things. Because aggressiveness of Russia towards Eastern Europe is a legacy uh, tracing back to the Tsarist regime and carried on through the Soviet regime, and of which uh, Putin is just the last representative. And so, I mean, it's the imperial ideology. Uh, united with nostalgia and revanchism, that it's at the basis of Putin regime. And so to say that that attitude is just the product of nations joining NATO is precisely to reverse the order of things, because the aggressiveness of Russia is an historical precondition, uh -huh. having been there for centuries. And nations like Ukraine, uh, wanting, presumably, because as it was pointed out, it was just a very informal talk and there was no serious advancement of the proposal, but purported will to join NATO is just 
the result of this perceived threat uh, as a as a natural uh, and only uh, pathway towards uh, protecting one's sovereign for sovereign security and independence. And I mean the fact that Putin says that. The, inv the, the invasion and the aggressiveness is the result of NATO expansion. I mean, that's just Putin lying, is what he does. He, li he lies all the time to his people, to the rest of the world, because he's always busy uh, creating this narrative where he's always justified, he's always perceived as the victim, and every, everything he does is just an answer to an external provocation. So this is my issue with the provocation thesis. Mm. Well, I tend to agree with you that um, East and West have been sending their troops over that part of the world from time immemorial. And it comes from both sides. And both sides are responsible. And I think when the Germans arrived on the continents, it was Celts mm -hmm. who were the West and enslaved the Germans. And that, it's a part of the world where everybody wants to have a fight. And, and yes, the, the history of Russia in conquering and invading uh, the countries to the West, it's a terrible history. But the countries to the west invading the east is pretty terrible too. And I think our, the most recent example was Germany. And um, so it's, um, it's a terrible history. And the people caught in the middle, it's, it only hurts them. It only hurts them. But Germany has been doing business with the Russians in the last decades. So you don't think Putin can see rationally Germany as a threat right now? Germany's a member of NATO, and uh, it's, he sees NATO as a threat. Um, it's, um, again, I agree with him. Nothing justifies this invasion, but it was not unprovoked. But, but Russia is dependent on the West at the same time Okay. It, if Putin feels threatened by the West, he also uh, is, relies on the West for, for many things. Um, no, yeah, let's go to the next question. Yeah, I wanted to mention uh, three points. Uh, first of all, uh, I think two of them are being uh, widely overlooked and I think they should be taken into consideration to assess all this topic. I wanted to start with uh, Putin's uh, speech uh, itself. Uh, well, his presidential address that was given uh, the day before the invasion when he uh, announced that he would be recognizing the independence of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, he gave a 55 minute long uh, address and it's especially relevant for like, taking into consideration that this is uh, the left and the crisis in Ukraine to think that the 15 first minutes of this speech were heavily criticizing the Soviet Union heritage. Especially, it's in interesting to take into account why or which specific uh, sites of the Soviet Union he was criticizing. And it was um, the right that the Bolsheviks uh, gave to independence or to really uh, enter or exit the, the Union of Republics. So all this speech was criticizing uh, these rights of the republics inside the Union to really uh, join or exit the Union, to heavily criticize uh, the decision, which was on one of the main pillars in the revolution to leave the First World War, and this was another uh, decision heavily criticized by Putin. And the only uh, good thing he said is that, well, at some point Stalin came and all these formal rights were lost, uh, were lost. So 
the situation came back to that of the Russian Empire. Um, I wanted to make this point because um, I don't know whether being uh, accurate enough, Russia can be considered an empire uh, nowadays. But for sure, Putin made his point very clear and his intention very clear to coming back to the um, borders of the Russian Empire or uh, at least um, the same legal framework. I don't know exactly what uh, to say, how to precise this, but he made it very clear that the uh, main mistake of the Soviet Union was leaving the imperial system in Russia. And then, uh, I think this is the main point I would want to make now. I think it's being overlooked the uh, ties between Russia and Ukraine, and it was something addressed by Putin in his address. And I, I don't mean here only uh, economic uh, links or ties, but also uh, cultural and familiar. And if there is any Russian or Ukrainian here, they uh, can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think this explains, uh, this sheds light on why uh, the protests are, have been messy in Russia, uh, either uh, in the streets, which I don't know whether they have been missing or, or, missing or, not, or not, but for sure in social networks. Because this is a war not uh, against any uh, alien power or any alien uh, country or even ethnic, but uh, for people which are either the same ethnic, for people on both sides, especially for the most nationalistic in Russia, or a very close uh, um, people. Um, even Sometimes even as close as having relatives fighting in both sides. And I think this explains why these protests ha can have been massive and why I don't think that this hypothesis of Putin uh, starting the war to unify the people around him, I think it's quite the opposite. He would know that a uh, war against a, a broader country which we maybe we could say, at least when it comes to cultural ties or familiar ties, uh, would be extremely unpopular. And I also think this would explain why you don't have to record to foreign uh, agencies um, trying to, um, yeah, trying to move these protests against the government because they already have, apart from the internal issues, they have uh, a war with. Uh, a very close uh, country and a lot of um, people uh, going on. And third, I, mean, I, I know I'm uh, talking too much, but I want to uh, give just a final uh, comment on the evolution of the situation because it was mentioned. And I don't think, I, I'm personally extremely worried because I don't think uh, this has an easy solution. I don't think, when it comes to geopolitical explanations, uh, sometimes we only see the part from Russia, or it's only mentioned, being encircled by NATO. But on the other hand, uh, this can also see uh, as a huge problem for all countries surrounding Russia, having the lesson that if you try to move further from Russia, you will get bombed and you will get invaded, as already uh, happened in Georgia and as it already happened, and it's happening now in Ukraine. And both parties acknowledge that. So for Putin now, it's a no go, no go back uh, moment. He knows that every country uh, around them will know that uh, this can happen and they will be extremely um, uh, distrusting him and um, uh, getting in NATO as fast as possible if, uh, is, if they can. And on the other hand, uh, Ukraine now has a war with uh, Russia. Ukraine has a lot of, um, a huge deal of, the, of their population armed. Um, they have been fighting for one month. Some of them have been working for, for eight years. So I don't think the most nationalistic parts of the militias or the army will accept any, um, any negotiation mm -hmm. accepting the independence of uh, the eastern part of Ukraine or accepting that Crimea will join. Mm -hmm. Russia. I think they would uh, they would make a rebellion or a coup against uh, Zelensky if he just accepts such a treaty. 
Sorry, Farmer Dan. One possibility I hold out, all right, and it's a grim possibility. It's, um, you know, once he got Crimea, then he feels a threat from the British Navy and the US Navy. Um, if we're lucky, his real goal is just to get that land bridge to Crimea. And I don't know, you really can't trust the news on what they tell you about war. All right. Uh, but he's moving pretty fast in the South. He's, he, he's got his land bridge. And um, it goes all the way to Kherson. Question is, will he take Odessa too and render Ukraine landlocked, or will he leave that alone? Uh, maybe all he really wants is security for Crimea and the Black Sea and to own the Azov. That's a possibility. Um, is Zelensky going to accept that willingly? Probably not, but it might be imposed on him. It might be imposed on him. I think if Russia tries to occupy Ukraine, they're gonna end up like the United States and in Afghanistan. Um, it'd be teach an invader a lesson, uh, but that's a terrible way to live. Um, <laughs> that's a terrible thing. There is that possibility. And I have noticed he moved really fast down south. He's got his land bridge. Whereas up north, it's, it's taking that column an awfully long time to go a pretty short distance. So maybe it won't be as bad as it could be. Maybe. I appreciate your remarks, uh, particularly about um, the um, uh, familial ties between the two peoples, and that being part of the reason that there are people out in the streets. I think that's uh, uh, a very salient point. I, I, I don't know what Putin wants. Um, I, do, I, do, I do think that um, he is miscalculated and overstepped. And um, the fact that he came out yesterday and announced that there are no conscripts and will be no conscripts means that, of course, they're conscripts, right? And uh, the extent to which um, the, the Russian people or the army uh, will put up with it, uh, I, I don't know, right? Uh, will there be uh, another, you know, battleship Potemkin, you know? Um, well, I don't think they're eating, you know, red and, you know, red infested <laughs> food, but, you know, I. One, one can hope that there you know, would be such an uprising, but uh, perhaps the idea that, you know, well, we're fighting against our brothers, you know, may uh, cause some in the military to pause. I think it is causing some in the oligarchy to pause because they don't want to go down with, with Putin's ship. Um, I'll, I'll take a, the, I'll, I'll ask a question real quick. Maybe specifically towards you, but I, I uh, open to, to the other, other two as well. <coughs> you earlier, you you know, you were talking about uh, states and um, you know the the self the right of self determination of states, mm -hmm. um, and just now you brought up you know the battle you know the battleship Potemkin and uh, early twentieth century politi politics uh, political struggle, and you've also been bringing up the need for leftists to have an international movement. Would it be fair to say that you think we should have a new international? One. And then also, I guess regarding, you know, Potemkin, the, the thing about that is that historically there was a massive international, the second international still around back then. 
Um, what, you know, uh, there's, there's statehood and there's statehood. What about the, the greatest state of them all, the dictatorship of the proletariat? And I guess I'll leave it at there. I realize that's rather, it's, it's, a, it's a funny word or phrase to say in 2022 because it seems so far away. And yet for those on Potemkin, maybe it seemed not so far away. Oh, I think it seemed pretty far away to them too. Um, is there a need for another international? Um, my political trajectory comes out of the uh, out of the fourth international, it, it specifically um, <coughs> Max Schachtman's break with Trotsky over the characterization of the, of the Soviet Union, whether it was a deformed worker state, um, as Trotsky maintained, or um, as Schachtman said, well, when the state owner o owns the, the means of production, then the next question is, who owns the state? Right? <clears throat> and in the Soviet Union, it was clear that it was not uh, the proletariat uh, that owned the state. Um, at the moment, I mean, the, the fourth international is, is just a, a, a shell of itself. Um, is there a need for a new international? Well, I would hope that someday there will be. I don't see it, you know, around the corner because I don't see, you know, mass revolutionary movements um, that, you know, could hook up um, would that we, would that, you know, we, um, may I live long enough to see this, right? But I, you know, I've lived long enough to, um, to, to think that I won't. <laughs> um, the, the, the forces of, of capital are um, overwhelming. Um, that's not to say that uh, there won't be massive uprisings. I mean, there were in the 60s when you had, you know, a, globally a, a generation coming of age. Um, I, don't, I don't see that happening, um, but it's our task to, uh, to push that along, you know, in our own, in our own countries, in our own, um, in our own, Factories and our own places of work. You know, it's all. You know, this is something we have to build. Is there a need for a for of a, of a new international? Um, you know, I wish there were. I, I would add to that that um, I think perhaps we don't need some institution like an international these days. It's already like. I'm, you know, part of a small organization, but we have connections all over the world. Well, not all over the world, but in Britain, uh, different parts of the US, um, Turkey, Greece, just like people we know and we talk to, and they're part of organizations and we can get, get in touch with them, see how they're doing things. And if you read, I, I haven't read too much of common turn stuff, but it's, it's largely like how to make an organization uh, how to do practical work, and this you can get um, by a Zoom call to the Workers' Party of Britain or something like that. Or you can read, you know, you know, working class, you know, newspapers like Labor Notes to, you know, to see, you know, on the ground what's happening in, you know, w with militant labor in the United States. I mean, there's. There are things going on uh, we can you can plug into, but I agree that you know the the fact that you know this is being you know zoomed all over you know theoretically all over the globe. I mean, yeah, is there a, a need for a you know for an international like there was in the old days? I'm not so sure. So, sorry to like add on to what the moderator said, uh, Joel, but then I'm curious how you can say, how you can both call for an international peace movement, but at the same time seem to have a sentiment that like an international or something like an international movement 
possible. Um, or, I mean, to elaborate on that. Um, you say we, at least, even if there's no need for it presently, what we can do is push towards that. Mm -hmm. We can specify what you mean in that case. Like, what is the world? If it's the case that an international, or something like an international, is impossible, or at least that's what I feel is applied in your remarks, um, then what is the role of leftists? I didn't say it was impossible. I, I said that I don't see it happening at the moment. There's, there's no international, there's no large international movement at, at the moment, right? Now, as I said, I hope to live long enough to see one where, you know, a, a, an international organization, um, you know, becomes, you know, a very important thing. Right? Um, my group, Solidarity, we are, we are international socialists. We don't believe in socialism in one country any more than Lenin did, right? Um, <coughs> of course, that's you know, a whole series of discussions out of that. But, um, you know, I, 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 it, would, that it were, would that it were on the table at the moment, right? It's, it, I don't see it on the agenda. Let's put it on the agenda. It takes a lot of hard work and organizing and risk taking and you know, working with others. Um, yes, yeah, should, should there be you know, um, ties to other organizations in other countries? Yeah, of course. Yeah. But is there a need for a formal body? I don't, I don't see it. It's like the question, do we need in this country, do we need a revolutionary party? What's a revolutionary party going to do? We're not in revolutionary times, right? So I, 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 it's the same sort of question, you know. Yeah, hopefully someday we'll have a need for a revolutionary party, right? I'm not going to go out and build one now because it's pointless. We need to get to that. We need to get to that point where it's important. So that's all I'm saying. Did that answer? Um, I hope this isn't too ignorant of a question, but I would like to know how you all think about the sanctions, um, how effective uh, you think they can be, how effective we should hope they uh, w would be, given that on the one hand we're saying that we all um, condemn, or I think, I think uh, yeah, that we're, we're, we all sort of condemn what Russia is doing in, in Ukraine, and perhaps they can, I don't know, uh, I want to know from you guys, maybe they can function as uh, a punishment and perhaps deterrence of similar kind of um, war crimes in the future or something. But on the other hand, there, there are um, obviously uh, a lot of harm done to uh, people, ordinary people in Russia, outside of Russia. I just want to know how you guys think about all of the financial dimensions of this war. I think that the sanctions we've adapted so far are really going to screw up the Russian economy. On the other hand, if we really wanted to cripple them, we'd, we'd stop buying energy from them. <coughs> and it's not so much the United States, but Europe is very much dependent on, on Russia for energy. And um, that's the one trigger they're not willing to pull. And I understand why, and Putin knows it. He, they don't want to pull that trigger because it'll hurt. He doesn't want to pull that trigger because that's his, his monetary lifeline. That's what gets him hard dollars. And it'll take a while for him to build alternatives. Um, um, you know, in, they talk about a stacked economy. And uh, a number of nations have been stacking their economies in recent years because they see this disintegration coming. And, um, you know, the stacking is, how much can I do by myself? And probably the most stacked economy in the world right now is China. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because all the other stacks still, still depend on them. Mm -hmm. um, but they kind of look at that as a model. Um, 
we're not there yet. Russia's not there yet. Um, and I don't think, as a practical matter, Europe can go without Russian oil and gas. Just can't. It would be a disaster. Um, and I also think it's interesting that the United States is is already describing. I mean, I saw an article in Bloomberg today saying people coming back to to Venezuela mm -hmm. as Maduro turns to capitalism. Well, it's mm -hmm. is Maduro turning to capitalism? No, but we want Venezuelan oil and. Americans don't want to use socialist oil, so let's just call it capitalist and, and work something out with Maduro. And um, it's, um, you know, I, we're not totally, uh, we're, I, I think it's really like 8% of our oil, which isn't a big deal, although it's disruptive. And we could make that up with Venezuela, we split. I mean, that shows how crazy it is. States is after they did all these terrible things to Venezuela. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, we need your oil. We're friends again, and you're a capitalist. I, I'm not making that story up. You can check Bloomberg. Yeah. As, as Venezuela turns to capitalism, exiles return. Yes. I want to add yeah, one yeah, thing. Sorry, is I think it's something like 70% of Russia's exports are in natural gas and uh, oil. Um, and so if this is their lifeline, and <laughs> if, if, they, they're, if they, they don't uh, strike right Russia where it hurts, I mean like 70% is like right there, all the eggs are right there in that basket that you're not going for. It just kind of shows they're not that serious about Ukraine. We have some some big things we could use on Ukraine, um, on Russia. And we've got nuclear weapons and we've got energy, and we're not using either of them. Uh, I, I um, the figure that I saw was one point six percent. You know, we could <laughs> arm wrestle over it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about um, sanctions. Uh, let's turn it around. How would I feel about uh, the opposite of sanctions? That is, um, you know, you know, doing something that would support uh, the Russian uh, economy so that they could maintain <laughs> the war. Well, I don't think I would be for that. Um, but am I for you know a the capitalist class um, using economic sanctions as a you know as a proxy for you know um, your shooting war? Well, I suppose it's better than a shooting war. Um, is it is it good to hurt the um, the the Russian masses with with sanctions? Uh, well, of course not, but to what extent are these sanctions actually hurting the masses? Or are the masses being hurt by the, by the, by the Russian, you know, as I say, gangster, you know, capitalism? Um, you know, I think they're being hurt more by that than, than you know, by, by the sanctions. Um, so, I haven't fully thought it through. Question. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, this is to all the panelists. Um, if um, you dis if you achieved your desired war outcome, you know, for instance, Ukraine successfully exercised the right to self determination and somehow miraculously beat the Russians, or if the Russians um, successfully, I don't know, um, kill all the neo Nazis in Ukraine, uh, how would this contribute to the struggle for socialism? Do you think? If that outcome were achieved, what does it mean specifically for socialism? That was my that was my talk. Summarize. <laughs> oh, well. I mean, if Russia succeeds, um, it's, it's it's I don't know how big of a retreat it is, but it is a retreat for the U.S. Empire, and that can only be good for us as socialists. And it's unfortunate what that means because that means the accelerate the 
intensification of crisis at home. But frankly, we don't have anything to do with international politics. I mean, who are you? Who am I? Um, but uh, our job is to be able to direct that discontent uh, away from like demagogic appeals of the ruling class towards like independent working class politics. But, and so they're setting the, the stage, they're setting the crisis, and we need to, I guess, be the main actors, um, uh, be able to direct people's energy to something productive, something progressive, um, rather than what are the alternatives, right? Well, I, I reject any suggestion that a, um, a Russian victory in uh, the Ukraine uh, advances the cause of uh, the international working class. I reject that entirely. Um, it's, it's, for one thing, it would, be a, it would be a disaster for the Ukrainian working class. Uh, you certainly don't want that. Uh, the imposition of, you know, the, the Ukrainian government is also sort of a gangster capitalist capitalism, right, with its own, with its own um, oligarchy that is uh, uh, very adept at stealing, stealing the wealth uh, uh, from, from the Ukrainian people. Um, does that mean that I, that I want Russia to win? Of course not. I, I believe that the Ukrainian, um, the their ability to defend themselves and their right to self-determination is, is paramount. Now, let me just suggest that Boris Kegarlitsky is very optimistic, perhaps a little too optimistic, but he points out that every time Russia has lost a war, <coughs> something progressive has happened, <laughs> right? So like the 1850, you know, the, lost the Crimean War, and what happened? Well, it was the end of serfdom, right? And there were, there were some advances in liberties and sort of a free press, right? And he goes on to point out that, you know, after every Russian defeat, there's, there's a, a positive change in, in, in the Russian political economy. You know, so he's very optimistic that, you know, uh, maybe the people will, will rise up. Right? There, there, there are certainly segments of the Russian population that is, that is showing their readiness to confront the authorities, um, whether it's because of a war with their, with their family members <laughs> um, or whether it's for economic reasons. Um, <coughs> So uh, a, 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 a victory by Russia it does nothing to advance. Um, in fact, it, it, in my view, it, it retards the, um, uh, the process of building you know, a workers' democracy and, and socialism. So one thing that I wanted to point out is I think all three of you have used the word we in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it's sort of inconsistently. So I think, um, for instance, you said we when you meant the Black Lives Matter protests, right? You also said we in terms of I don't know, the United States, right? Um, I feel like you said we meaning uh, a Russian victory against the United States is good for the American working class in some way. You did imply that though. You did imply that, um, not in your presentation, but just now. And I feel like maybe Joel, you kind of, you know, just pointed out, you know, good for which working class, like good for, you know, the Ukrainian working class, good for the American working class, good for the Russian working class, what have you. Um, but that we <coughs> is a little bit vexed, isn't it? Right, rather than they, right? Like they, the government, you know, they, you know, the, whether it's the American, U.S. government, Russian government, Ukrainian government, they, the ruling class, they. Um, and it does, you know, really raise the issue of, like, the international or whatever. Like, who's this we? Is there a we that we can, you know, 
speak for, speak to, you know, is there, you know, like the people, like m maybe, um, you know, one note I made here, uh -huh. I mean, uh, the concept of self-determination has been mentioned uh -huh. with reference to states. States have no right of self-determination. People uh -huh. have a right of self-determination. Uh -huh. States have no rights whatsoever, to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, it's people who do. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's one of the things that makes something like Ukraine complicated. Mm -hmm. There are parts of Ukraine that would like to be with Russia. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't stand in their way. <coughs> right, that was one provocation that was not mentioned, which is the low-level war that's been going on for the last eight years. Um, and there, you know, the Ukrainian government did not accept the independence or autonomy of the Russian majority provinces that wanted to break away. And, and Crimea was pretty happy to get take, mm -hmm. pretty happy to get taken over as well. And as far as yep. like the neo Nazis are concerned, there are like there's like the Ukrainian government official military, but there are militias. There is there's been a war going on. You know? I, I don't criticize um, other countries for having ex right wing extremists in their military because we have them, sure, yeah. sure. and not just in our military, but in our police and every other security service sure, we sure. have. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, mm -hmm. that's a feature of global politics, particularly. Do I like the fascists? No. I'm old. My dad killed the fascists. <laughs> Lots of them. Well, the government gave him medals for it. Yeah. <laughs> it disturbs me greatly that they've given some level of acceptance now. Uh, and speaking of, of, of uh, self-determination, I just want to read a little something here. No Democrat, let alone socialist, will venture to deny the complete legitimacy of the Ukraine's demands. And no Democrat can deny the Ukraine's right to freely secede from Russia. Only unqualified recognition of this right makes it possible to advocate a free union of Ukrainians and great Russians, a voluntary association of the two peoples. This is Lenin in 1917. It's, it's like the difference between Ireland belonging to the UK and Ireland belonging to the EU. One is voluntary and beneficial. The other one was involuntary. And I agree with you that, it, that, that the idea that states have rights is preposterous. It's like saying a, a building has the right to stand. No, no. <laughs> People have a right to build the building, but, you know. This is often used when talking about Israel. Well, Israel's right to exist. Well, it's a st stupid way of saying it. Well, what about the people? Because the people are not one thing either. Excuse me? The people. The people are not one thing either. Well, yeah. It's a being Marxist, but. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What about they, and the other people. I think we're coming to, come at a point in time where we have to force people to choose sides. That's what I meant by polarization. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we come out ahead on that. Um, I think we have the numbers and they don't, although lots of people worry about it. Um, you know, I like to say that every libertarian is one insult away from a fascist. <laughs> I say <laughs> insult them. And don't, don't let them stay in the middle. Yeah. Push them over to the right. Every libertarian is one step away from fascist. One, one, say, one insult away yeah, from fascist. One, so one <laughs> say that, um, it's wonderful. Know, every libertarian is one Catholic. One layoff away from being a socialist. Yeah. I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, well I, I, I don't know about yeah, that. Depends. There, there are people in the middle who can be pulled our way if we force them. But I don't, I, I, that might just be an Irish thing. Uh, <laughs> I, um, no room for libertarians. <laughs> At least not mm -hmm. as that term is defined in English speaking mm -hmm. countries. Well, you could say Libertarian well, socialists, that's fine. That's yeah, something I was else. Say, you could say anarchists are also one step away from being fascists. No, 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 no. no. The, 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 the when I say libertarian socialists, 
That means anarchist socialism. And, um, now I think um, <coughs> I think we're moving towards something much closer to anarchy, and um, that uh, the atomization thing. Mm -hmm. And the states are going to lose some power. And, I, and I'm a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, it wasn't Shakespeare, it was Dick the Butcher, and he was an anarchist. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't think Shakespeare liked Dick. I, you know, I didn't like Shakespeare. All right? So I kind of like Dick, even though I'm a lawyer. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think of um, a crew from Chicago went out to cover the Republican National Convention in 2016 in Cleveland. And because uh, they begged us, they said everybody else was afraid to come. And, um, you know, Chicago's not afraid of a Trump crowd. So we came. And um, in the way cops are always stupid, um, you know, any organized group on the street was identified them as anarchists. So um, uh, I'm monitoring their helicopter spotter and just laughing when it's like, anarchist medics converging on so and so and they swarm cops over. Well, the medics are just doing a shift change, you know, or anarchists with a box of rocks. No, it's, it's food not bombs with a bag, uh, with, a, with a, a cart full of bag lunches. And I was just waiting for him to do it to us. We did a shift change. Anarchist lawyers converging on public square, <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Um, the so anarchists, not Antifa. <laughs> that was before that. Like, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I, I do think that um, I do think that we're moving in a direction where we're going to get something much closer to anarchism. That doesn't mean that there won't be all sorts of connections between groups. Um, but there's going to be a lot of fragmentation. And, um, and really, what the most powerful creature, the thing that states are most scared of, all right, is, is not any single organization. It's a network of networks or what they call a segmented, polycentric, ideologically interrogated network, sometimes called uh, an all-channel network that operates by spontaneous, autonomous consensus. It's the scariest creature on the planet to them. <coughs> and, um, and sometimes they're just ad hoc. I and mean, today is the, somebody reminded me, it's the fifth anniversary of when we, or no, the sixth anniversary of when we kicked Trump out of Chicago. How did we do that? Well, it was a, it was a huge group of very different groups, but they had one thing in common that day, and they accomplished it. And um, those are the things, I mean, I, I, I don't know if anybody was there or if you just heard the PR from Trump, if they canceled it for security reasons. No, they didn't cancel it for security reasons. I, I, I mean, I told the deputy chief, somebody texted me from inside, it's canceled. And I said, Kevin, they canceled it for security reasons. And he's like, what the fuck, there aren't any security reasons. And he was the cop in charge of this. <laughs> no, Trump just got scared. He just got scared. He saw what was there, and he was scared, and he ran. And it was because of the composition of that group. Was it well organized? Was it rigidly hierarchical? No, it was horizontal. But everybody agreed on one thing, and they made it happen. I think that's the way of the future. Time for one more question. Um, go ahead. So we've, we've pointed out some good nuances about um, a we versus they. It's sort of difficult to determine what that necessarily means. And, um, and 
Although we might have different definitions, specific definitions of what a governing body might be, but or you know a governing state. Um, overall, I think it's fair to say, unless I'm um, being simplistic, that we're talking about a struggle of kind of a, a common people, uh, so to speak, versus governing bodies. And so I guess, and, and you know, you've touched on it, like we're, we're mentioning anarchy a little bit, but um, to safeguard against these sorts of large um, state-led events of violence, just in general, you know, um, cultural influences uh, aside, um, political influences aside, is it possible to form a state that avoids these sorts of things indeterminately? Could there be safeguards against that? And uh, if not, what does uh, what does six? How could you characterize success? How could you characterize either a uh, successful um, anti-violent, anti-war governing body, or is that just uh, is that a contradiction? Maybe uh, in answering your question, this question, um, if you, if you decide to, um, you could uh, kind of wrap up any uh, closing statements if you have. Chris, did we answer uh, all your yeah, questions? Yes. Okay. Cool. <coughs> um, so I guess we could go in the order that we started the talk. Sure. Um, I I, like in your comment, I don't see where we're talking about the class struggle, the proletariat and the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, the imperialist bourgeoisie. Um, it's like states uh, detached from any material base, just kind of floating there, oppressing like large swathes of kind of amorphous people. I, I kind of I lose you there. Um, but perhaps someone else. Did you have any clarification for that? I'm sorry. That was too harsh. <laughs> no, it's not harsh. Sometimes I worry there's no difference like between these classes, that it's just people in circumstance. And I say this. Um, my parents are from the Soviet Union, and they and they fled. Um, and the biggest lesson of the Soviet Union is that it reflects the U.S., you know, and vice versa. Um, and it doesn't. It didn't matter. There wasn't a kind of they invading. It was just people spontaneously entering roles that through um, some kind of necessity um, spurred on violence. Um, you know, it could be characterized by many different things, but at the end of the day, you know, people get killed, lives are destroyed. Um, and these things just seem to perpetuate themselves through governing bodies at large, um, whether they were meant to initially or not. I like your concept of the mirror. It's, um, I don't think people always sufficiently appreciate that. And, you know, Marx said Feuerbach found Hegel standing on his head and turned him right side up. It's a good metaphor. But I'd say he put a mirror in front of him. And the thing is, the images look the same. Just all the signs have changed. But with a human being, it looks identical. It's only when you get something discursive, like text, that you know it's different. I like your metaphor. I would, uh, just to conclude, I would repeat that uh, our enemy is at home, and uh, Russia, China, um, they can, the working classes of those countries can handle their own issues, and 
our chief enemy is always, in every situation, at home. I'll just conclude by saying <coughs> I, I'm not against states. I'm not against the concept of a state. Um, I'm for a state um, that comprises institutions of the working class. I want a state in which the working class is in charge and rules through its own democratic institutions. What that's going to look like I have no idea, right? Um, uh, Marxism is not a blueprint. Marxism is a methodology uh, for understanding and changing the world. But I'm not <clears throat> um, against states because states can be repressive. In fact, um, you can imagine that at the beginning of a, of a socialist revolutionary revolution, um, the, the bourgeoisie will be repressed. It doesn't mean physically, but you know, the expropriated. Um, but so I'm not I'm not against the uh, the, the idea of a state, and I, I would I think without a state, um, you have a lot of really bad things that can happen. Right. So um, then I'll just I'll just um, conclude by saying that yes, whereas. Um, our task is to oppose um, our bourgeoisie and, um, and yes, the, the Russian masses need to oppose theirs and the Chinese need to oppose theirs, but right? that doesn't mean that we can't act in solidarity with them. We, we, we have to act in solidarity with the Chinese masses, with the Chinese working class and with the, with the Russian working class with the Venezuelan working class, right? That yes, our immediate task is here at home, but that doesn't mean we should ignore, um, you know, internationalism. Wow. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. that the Platypus Affiliated Society will be hosting its annual convention at the very end of uh, March, in the first few days of April. I recommend going to our website, Platypus 1917, for more information. Um, we have PRs, feel free, Platypus Reviews, feel free to take a copy and write your email address if you'd like to be on our uh, list uh, specifically with uh, Northwestern's activities here. Um, is there going to be a social gathering? I think we might go to this bar in Heaven's thing called Bat 17 if you'd like to join us for drinks and more conversation. Um, Where I I, I'd love to. I'd have to get out. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Okay. I, I got to get to the south side. Well, thank you so much. I also me. encourage people to go to our website, solidarity-us.org. We publish a, a magazine called Against the Current, and so you could also go to againstthecurrent.org. So you can find out more about us. And I printed off in advance a couple essays, uh, a couple versions, uh, draft, how do you say it? A couple, whatever these are, um, of uh, Lenin's uh, defeat of one's own government in the imperialist war. So if anybody wants one, I think I have 10 of them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, folks.